now we are moving to our second session on non invasive ventilation i would like to introduce dr bagindra gunavardhana consultant emergency physician currently attached to district general hospital mathura to present the lecture over to you sir good morning everyone uh, today I'm... so uh, before moving into the proper lecture topic, I would like to start with uh, discussing about respiratory failure. Um, as you all know, the respiratory failure is a clinical condition which happens when the ICER respiratory system fails to maintain their main function, that is gas exchange. Uh, there are two types of respiratory failure. Uh, one is type 1 respiratory failure. We also know as hypoxemic respiratory failure. So what's the problem is there's a problem in oxygenation. Uh, at the alveolar capillary membrane level. So when you do a, uh, ABG, you can see arterial oxygen saturation is less than 60 with normal level, subnormal carbon dioxide level. Uh, these are some examples of uh, type 1 respiratory failure, which can occur in pneumonia and metallic due to shunting effect. And also uh, can be seen in and pulmonary fibrosis due to diffusion limitation and alveolar hyperventilations. So, how can we intervene in this situation? Um, air yeah, supplying to the patient that is FiO2 and also or increase the mean airway pressure. So, that will recruit the alveoli, that will improve the oxygenation, and that will fix the patient's problem. And uh, the second type is type 2, uh, inability to do, uh, exchange their carbon dioxide due to the pump failure. So when you do the ABG in this patient, you can see increased carbon dioxide level with reduced pH. So these are some examples for type 2 respiratory failure. This can occur due to central obstruction in CNS depression, upper airway obstruction, lower airway obstruction, or due to neuromuscular disorder. So how do we intervene in this situation? So we can either increase minute ventilation of this patient by increasing respiratory rate or tidal volume or changing the dead space or ch by changing the expiratory time. And I will start to serve in brief to epithelial uh, type 2 epithelial cell and interstitial epithelial cell and vascular epithelial cell uh, occur due to viral infection and which give rise to uh, change in the lung. So this change in changes in lung occur in, in two phases. We call it one is early phase and another one is late phase. In early phase, you can see the uh, pulmonary vasculopathy of thrombosis and late phase, you can see widespread lung atelectasis and that will um, give rise to non aerated pulmonary units Units. So uh, ultimately, the patient is going to the hypo hypoxemic respiratory failure. That is the main problem in um, COVID patient, and also it associates with the systemic inflammation. You call it cytokine storm syndrome. So where you can see the elevated um, serum, uh, CRP and ferritin level and interleukin six level. So we can um, use uh, those um, parameters to monitor the patient, severity of the patient, or uh, this uh, outcome of the patient. And finally, uh, we provoke the uh, DI systemic inflammation and direct viral epithelium. This is the natural history of um, and stage two. Yeah, we are the primary changes occur. So okay. at this stage, patient can uh, present with shortness of breath and or hypoxia. And when you go to the final stage, you can see widespread uh, respiratory, uh, widespread uh, response of patient will end up with ARDS and 
cells or chalk. Okay. How we are going to manage, uh, see, uh, we can uh, divide the patient into three categories according to the severity of disease, uh, mild, moderate, and severe. So mild patient, we don't have to do anything, you just need to uh, regularly monitor the patient. When it comes to the moderate to severe patient, that is, uh, that is that patient saturation is less than 93, but they don't, do, they don't uh, show um, uh, increased work of breathing. So you can start um, low for oxygen, as Dr. Dylan mentioned, what you can use uh, either one of them. Uh, so you can go up to flow rate 50 minutes and how, how to uh, uh, check the patient vitals regularly whether the patient is going to deterioration. So when the patient come into the severe critical form, this is when the saturation less than 90 with the signs of work of breathing. So you have to select either high flow nasal oxygen cannula or CPAP or NIV de de devices. So we call it, they are the bridging therapy. So if you're going to start this vision therapy at your hospital, you have to aware of the um, oxygen supply at your hospital because, as you know, if, if for example, if if we start a high flow oxygen at 60 liter minutes, so that patient consume 12 jumbo cylinders per day, so it's a huge number of um, oxygen demand. So your hospital should have these facilities before you're going to start this time, uh, this treatment. So what is the best? High with the high phone or CPAP. Um, this is H I N U K. Um, they recommend one non invasive positive prayer ventilation when managing hypoxic respiratory failure patient who not uh, respond to their conventional oxygen therapy. Their data showed um, if we started high phone oxygen cannula for these kind of patients, there's a reduction in intubation and also 90 day mortality was, uh, was so reduced and uh, more ventilator free days associated with that. And this is other um, international um, societies which recommend uh, early, uh, early use of high nasal oxygen cannula or other uh, modality. Uh, WHO also recommend use a high flow nasal cannula early and Australia and New Zealand Society, uh, Intensive Care Society also recommend high flow nasal oxygen cannula. Okay, what, uh, um, this, is a, uh, this is a high flow nasal cannula, it has several parts, you have to be aware about that. Uh, this is a flow meter, you can um, check the flow that you're giving to the patient, this is a Oxygen air blender, you can adjust the saturation uh, FiO2 uh, by turning here and there. And uh, this is a, a, a heater, so it will heat the air uh, to the body temperature when, when it pass going through it. You have to uh, set the temperature, desired temperature before giving to the patient. Usually we start with 34 and then gradually increase to 37 to the body temperature. And this bag containing um, sterile water. Uh, that will help to humidify the air and don't use a, a normal saline or um, distilled um, and uh, dextrose to this one because they recommend to use the sterile water and this is a nasal cannula we attach to the patient this is a common machine available this one is available in Sri Lanka okay what happened is high for nasal nasal cannula so it has a large bow when compared to the conventional nasal cannula because of that you can give high flow to the patient and it will supply heated and humidified air because of sorry because of that it will reduce the airway inflammation uh, if you send a uh, cold and uh, dry air that causes irritation to your nasal passage and also reduce a normal um, mucosal function and end up with the um, reduction um, uh, collection of mucus. So that part uh, can be eliminated by using heated and humidified air. So also uh, this machine, you can give fixed um, FiO2. You can start with the 21, you can go up to 100. And uh, the advantage because of the way we can give high flow, you know, in normal, 
uh, maximum we can send is 15 liters per minute. But here we can go start with the 20 liters and go up to 60 liters per minute. That will match the patient ventilation demand because when the patient is respiratory stress, he will take more inflammatory flow. So with, by giving a high flow, you can match it. And uh, because of that, you can meet the patient in mid ventilation. And also it wash out the patient dead space. You see in this diaphragm, diaphragm, diagram, um, this continuous um, air will wash out the air in this oropharynx and uh, uh, continuously uh, replace this one and that will help to reduce the dead place. Then this is oxygenated air in this area. And also, uh, because it will wash out the carbon dioxide, because it dilutes the carbon dioxide in this part, so that will give good amount of oxygenated air in this part, and pay, uh, that will improve the patient oxygenation. And other thing is, it will uh, because of the continuous flow. It uh, if the patient mouth is closed, it will um, create a positive airway pressure in this passage, right? So it uh, it acts as a peep. No, not like you can't generate up uh, as you uh, as in a ventilator, but it, it can generate a small amount of peep and it helps to keep um, your uh, airway open. Some practical recommendations. So I would say I will say when when you are going to select the nasal prong, so it should not totally occlude the patient nose breath. Ideally, it should be a two-third of patient size of the patient nose breath. And um, in in Sri Lankan uh, College of Anesthesiology, uh, in their uh, guideline, they recommend a start flow rate from 50, uh, fifteen to twenty liters per minute in a COVID patient and uh, increase uh, according to the patient response. But some international guidelines say start with 30 to 40 liters per minute and you can increase according to the patient demand. And as I mentioned earlier, you have to set the patient a temperature that will come, uh, give a comfort to the patient. And also you can increase the FiO2 until you get the satisfactory uh, SpO2. And you can also uh, deliver the flow when you see uh, reduction in respiratory rate and um, your saturation becomes stable. Uh, that means that patient is responding to your management. What, uh, what, what, what are you going to monitor? So when you have put the patient on this uh, high flow of the nasal cannula, you have to um, monitor patient respiratory rate, heart rate and saturation initially more frequently, then you can space it out uh, depending on the patient uh, situation. Once the patient, um, become stable and when you have decided now patient is stable this patient no longer need high flow oxygenation cannula so then you can uh, wean off so how we are going to wean off so when we start with a reduction of fio2 by uh, 5 to 10 percent and reduce the flow rate by five liters minute and assess the patient um, clinical signs and symptoms symptom and once the patients this the machine's flow rate became less than 25 liters a minute and FIO2 less than 40 and when the patient is stable you can take the machine off from the patient. So if there's no improvement to your treatment you can escalate to the next level. In nutshell um, this humidif uh, high flow nasal external cannula provide heated and humidified air also um, match the patient inspiratory demands uh, by uh, meeting up the uh, patient peak inspiratory flow demand. Also increase the functional residual capacity by, in, uh, uh, by making a small peep and uh, providing a continuous uh, flow. It is lighter when, than when compared with uh, the CPAP or BiPAP machine. And it, the main advantage is it will uh, um, uh, inhibit the oxygenation dilution which can occur in other devices like other low flow oxygen devices because um, because of supplying continuous uh, flow high flow and is also helpful in uh, washing out of dead space of the patient so the this is uh, and when we go to the advantages of um, high flow uh, uh, high flow nasal cannula 
the main, the, the, the main advantage is loss risk of aspiration and it will reduce the need for intubation and patient, no claustrophobia. If you're going to put, um, put a CPAP, the patient, patient has cared of that because of the claustrophobia. Uh, what are the other indications than treating uh, COVID pneumonia? Um, mainly, uh, they, these are the indications, mainly uh, due to hypoxic respiratory failure associated with community acquired pneumonia, other viral pneumonia, acute asthma, or um, CO poisoning, carbon monoxide poisoning. And also you can use high flow nasal cannula to supply high FiO2 oxygenation in the situation when we are going to pre-oxygenation patient, anaptic oxygenation and post uh, to prevent the post intubation distress. And when we are managing patient um, who um, uh, said, uh, say no, we, have, we have decided not to do active resuscitation of this patient, then we can put, uh, give the high flow nasal oxygenation as a palliative therapy and also post cardiac surgery and when some uh, intervention like uh, bronchial lavage, TOE, upper GI endoscopy to supply high flow. All right. Um, uh, when uh, we uh, discuss about evidence, uh, there are a lot of evidence uh, to support use of high flow nasal oxygen cannula in um, COVID pneumonic patient as a uh, Early uh, treatment strategy. Um, the one China, uh, the one study done in China, they have found um, this higher survival rate in high flow uh, patient with high flow nasal cannula than an uninvasive and invasive ventilation. Um, okay, and some says uh, in the phase is preferably uh, better than bypass. All right, that's the end of high flow nasal cannulation and it will move to non-invasive ventilation. What is this non-invasive ventilation? So non-invasive ventilation is application of respiratory support via interface. This interface could be either a face mask, nasal cannula or full face visor or helmet without need of intubation. Uh, there are two types of non-invasive ventilation. It's a positive pressure ventilation or other one is negative generator to the chest like this iron lung um, iron lung that will generate the negative pressure that will help the patient breathe in but this is not commonly used nowadays because of very uh, you know it's very heavy and very bulky and difficult to use um, now we commonly use non uh, cpap and bipap uh, as a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation uh, this is a respite machine you it's very commonly used in uh, Emergency department and high dependency care unit. Um, it's a small one uh, compared with your conventional ventilator and easy to use. And I think it's cheaper than that. Uh, this is the interfaces that we use to deliver uh, non invasive positive pressure ventilator to the patient. Uh, we can use a nasal mask, uh, usually, it's helpful in the CDR patient with this uh, sleep obstructive sleep apnea and this is a full face mark this is a you call it a total face mark uh, this is the cpap uh, helmet this on carries this on advantages and disadvantages uh, when we talk about this uh, i think it's not available in sri lanka the main advantage is that it will prevent the contam uh, environment contamination in covid patient and is also if the patient um, uh, that will prevent aspiration if the patient uh, have active emesis. Uh, this is the one we usually uh, use in Sri Lanka. And the thing is, you have to uh, select the ideal size for the patient when you are going to uh, fix this on the patient face. It should cover the bridge of uh, nose and lower part of mouth. It should not be jutting out from the cheek. So this IL, because of that, um, it, uh, because uh, if you use proper mask, that will prevent uh, unnecessary leaking, and uh, you can give it your target uh, setup to the patient. And before starting uh, this one, you have to explain to the patient what you, what are you going to do with otherwise the patient will become very anxious. Uh, that will um, uh, not going to helpful, and you are going to do it. 
And another thing is um, you have to keep this uh, mask once you start start the machine. You have to keep this mask on patient face uh, without uh, putting the strap and allow patient to um, get used to this one. And after patient um, get used, and you can uh, uh, strap uh, fix the straps. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are two modalities uh, in an, an invasive positive pressure ventilation. One is continuous positive pressure airway, another one BPAP. BPAP. So, what is this? Uh, also known as a conventional way, uh, when you put the patient on CPAP machine, it will give continuous. Uh, it will give continuous positive pressure throughout patient respiratory cycle, and you can apply if the patient is breathing spontaneously, because it does not give us uh, respiratory uh, when uh, respiratory support like by by BiPAP. So, um, so you can't use in patient with apnea and who is hypoventilating. So this uh, CPAP is to fix the oxygenation failure, especially in patient with the type one uh, of the respiratory failure. In COVID patient also most of them have type one respiratory failure, so you can use CPAP. So what happened? Because once you're giving a positive pressure ventilation, um, uh, patients alveoli uh, split or keep split open uh, and that will uh, prevent them collapsing during expiration and also this will uh, recruit the more alveoli that will increase the matching between ventilation perfusion and that will in finally increase the saturation patient saturation also uh, this um, um, uh, it will also increase the mean airway pressure by which you can increase the functional respiratory capacity of patient and that will cause a um, large amount of air at the alveolar level to the ventilator. So it is said the CPAP may be the best modality of NIV in COVID patient. How it come, how it become best modality? Because it does not augment the patient tidal volume. So that will facilitate more lung protective ventilation. And it also provides the greatest amount of mean, art, mean al, um, alveolar pressure when compared with the BiPAP. So it effective, it will have full and effective recruitment. So I will show in this paragraph what I mentioned earlier. So the, this, of, uh, this graph show uh, mean alveolar pressure in uh, CPAP and BiPAP mode. This is a blue line. Uh, is uh, the uh, mean alveolar pressure uh, in a patient uh, in a patient who has set to uh, CPAP at 18 centimeter of uh, water, and this uh, dotted red line shows the mean alveolar pressure when you set the BiPAP at uh, 18 to uh, 6, 18, 18 over 6. So you can see, you can see this be uh, in uh, CPAP. The mean alveolar pressure is greater than uh, mean alveolar pressure in BiPAP in that setup. So that means the uh, so CPAP machine um, can, if, if somebody put on CPAP machine, can uh, recruit the more alveoli than the BiPAP machine. And in COVID patient, you see, you know, that there is a widespread uh, micro lactases. Uh, in lung, so in, when you are using CPAP, you can open up this alveoli because it's providing the greatest mean alveolar pressure. Okay, how are I going to set up the patient? Once you attach the patient to the uh, machine, so your target would be a normal patient, I mean, uh, but, uh, uh, but seriously in patient, target would be to uh, increase your saturation more than 94. And if it is more in, uh, ill patient, then you are going to uh, keep your target between 88 to 92. Uh, here we uh, usually we increase, we start the P value of five and then gradually increase to 15. But in the COVID patient, they said 
have to start form was 7 and then gradually increase to 50 to 8. So while you are increasing the PEEP, uh, you can uh, check with the patient saturation, arterial saturation, respiratory effort, and hemodynamics. These are the things we have to monitor once we have started the PEEP. A patient, whether the patient, uh, usually after 30 minutes to one hour, you can check whether the patient is going to, um, uh, patient condition is going to improve or further deteriorate. Uh, you have to check the uh, saturation, you have to check the work of breathing, you have to check the uh, level of conscious, and also you have to check the hemodynamics, and um, you have to do the ABG and uh, analyze the um, blood gas. And sometimes patients can deteriorate due to um, development of new complications like uh, pneumothorax and sputum retention. Uh, this is a uh, this is a um, diagram. Uh, this graph two graphs and it will show the yeah, intravenous pressure during both in under assisted breathing and patient who have on CPAP. You can see continuous positive airway pressure during the throughout the breathing. Okay, let's move to the BiPAP mode. Uh, BiPAP is merely for the patient with the type two respiratory failure. That means there's a problem is where ventilation. In the COVID in COVID patient, uh, you can uh, you can use if they have concomitant COPD or if they are seen in their blood gas carbon dioxide retention, then you can switch to the BiPAP mode. So whole mark of this BiPAP mode is there are two set of uh, uh, pressure support we are giving to the patient. One is EPAP, that's an open CPAP, and IPAP. This IPAP. Uh, when the machine gives IPAP when the patient start to breathe. They are in space, then they are space cycle machine gives IPAP. The most important thing is the difference between IPAP and EPAP. You call this pressure support in uh, your conventional ventilator. This pressure support is important to increase the tidal volume. That tidal volume ultimately reduces the patient carbon dioxide level. So if you want to eliminate carbon dioxide, so the thing is, you have to increase the IPAP. If you want to increase oxygenation of this patient, you have to elevate EPAP. Uh, this is uh, BPAP in, uh, and also called ST mode. And this is what I mentioned uh, earlier. So you have that one also, you have to start with five to uh, EPAP, start from five and you can go up to 15. And IPAP, you can start from the 10 and you can go up to 20. Uh, in COVID patient, you may have to do uh, 17 or, um, by 12 uh, to get a good uh, outcome. This is uh, as in a, a CPAP mode, in, when you're patient in the BiPAP mode, you have to monitor the patient's uh, saturation, work of breathing, and um, arterial to arterial blood gas and hemodynamics and ultimately uh, check whether the patient is improving or deteriorating. If the patient is uh, um, not improving with your changes and then you have to escalate patient to the other level of care, maybe, that is intubation. So as I mentioned earlier, if the patient remains uh, pressure respirate, remain more than 20 minutes or carbon dioxide more than 45, that means this alveol is not ventilating. So you have to increase the IPAP by um, uh, two centimeter of water increment. If the saturation remains 88, you can try with increasing EPAP. If patient still remain carbon dioxide, PSE to remain high, then you have to check whether, uh, whether you have select a proper FIO2, especially in the patient with the COPD. So that we have to reduce uh, FIO2 in that case patient or if there's excessive leaking from the mask. So if there's an ongoing de deterioration, you have to uh, consider intubation and mechanical ventilation. These are the ad advantages of non-invasive ventilation in general. So these are the advantages you, it will reduce the mortality and reduce the it will be a reduction in the ICU days and also reduction the deep airway infection like ventilated associated pneumonia occurring 
ventilation station and also prevent the intubation injuries and possibly some uh, if you put in a uh, nasal mask patient can communicate the risk is this an uninvasive intubation is uh, it will cause misapplication and inefficiency can lead to respiratory failure there's a high risk of aspirin especially if you use high uh, value of pressure if you set the patient uh, to your peep peep value to uh, about the 10 there's a risk of aspiration and it will also cause a dry up with your airway and cause a necrosis to the uh, site uh, where the mask um, fit in on. What are the country case indicator you use are the your non-invasive ventilator? Uh, you can categorize in according to anatomical, physiological, and human factor. So anatomical means if the patient has recent upper airway GS surgeries, um, you, you, we do not use or maxillofacial uh, uh, injury uh, surgery or base of skull fracture or area obstruction. And physiology, we do not use if the patients have active cardiac or respiratory arrest. And other thing is if the patient not able to protect his airway, that is poor cough and um, de decreased level of conscious state. And also for the patient with untreated pneumothorax, we are not going to use this um, mode. And intractable vomiting. Human factor, when it comes to when it comes to human factor, you don't use the patient if patient refuse not, especially in the palliative care, if the patient refuses, so you won't be you're not going to put it. And when there's any aggressive or agitated patient, it's very difficult to use this one. And staff inexperience. What are the complications? Complication in general, so when we're using this uh, uh, tight fitting mask, it can cause pressure on some necrosis, especially around the nasal bridge in elderly people. And it also can cause a facial and ocular abrasion and it cause eye irritation, loose fitting mask, uh, because there's a, a leakage from this uh, mask and go into the eye and cause an ocular irritation. And the claustrophobia and agitation, and also that can cause uh, hypotension in a patient who is already hypovolemic. And there's increased risk of aspiration and it will increase the risk of uh, increase your intracranial pressure and intraocular pressure. And because of if you put the patient on mask, it will be difficult to give new um, foods for this patient. This is my last slide uh, that will uh, this summary of overall management of COVID patients. So we'll start with a uh, low four nasal cannula. And then if patient need to deteriorate, we have to escalate it into the high flow nasal cannula or CPAP mode. Now we know most of them recommend use high flow nasal cannula as initial management because there are a lot of advantages. And so, uh, if this one is not, you can interchange this time because especially uh, during the daytime, you can keep the patient high for nasal cannula and the night time you can uh, put it on the CPAP because when the patient with the high for nasal cannula, you can do a prone, prone, uh, weight proning of the patient. And if still went, uh, failing, so then you can go to the me invasive mechanic ventilation, ultimately patient will end up with the ECMO. That conclude my lecture. Do you have any question? So in chat box, there are two questions. What is mean by bridging therapy? So bridging therapy is, uh, is a, uh, like if uh, the therapy between um, your con uh, conventional oxygenation and uh, ventilation, I mean, intubation and ventilation. So we use this, uh, this non, either the high flow nasal cannula and uh, non ventilation as a bridging therapy that will prevent the patient further deteriorating. Uh, what is the next question? Uh, please explain effectiveness. How can we can we have this? Yes, we have. Can we go for NG feeds who are in high flow and uh, the pro no, actually, I don't think we can um, give NG feeding when the patient is on high flow nasal because uh, that will um, prevent giving high flow nasal because you have to have good. Uh, fitted can, uh, nasal prong to give high flow nasal can cannula. Uh, in that case, you can have other mode of uh, feeding. 
any difference is single limb C pep and dual limb C pep. Uh, the only I I don't see any difference. Uh, the only thing is a dual uh, limb. That means there's a very uh, expiratory uh, 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 expiratory limb, so that will uh, prevent. Uh, prevent the, this uh, this uh, uh, your environment contamination with the infection. I think that's the only only advantage I can say at this moment. How long can we keep the patient in high flow oxygen? Uh, that is depend on the patient clinical uh, outcome. Uh, if the patient is deteriorating. Uh, you you can't do it, but if uh, if the physical patient getting uh, comfortable and they getting improving, uh, so you can uh, start weaning off. I think I think Baginda. So they are asking about the effectiveness of oxygen concentrator machine machine for providing oxygen in uh, high flow therapy. So oxygen concentrations usually don't give high flow. So they give usually five liters per minute, but there are some modern versions which gives about 10, 10 liters per minute. So you can't use for high flow oxygen therapy unless you convert with the use of some other high flow device, whether you convert it or you can't, just uh, oxygen concentrator, no high flow. Okay. And regarding this resmit CPAP uh, machine, uh, so the older version does not have FIO2 sensor, so you can't check it. So you have to go clinically and from the flow rate. And there are some newer version which have FIO2, FIO2 uh, sensor and FIO2 read as well. Uh, so you can, uh, so it depends on the model. So you can go through the model leaflet, booklet. And if it doesn't say uh, anything about FIO2 monitoring, that means you can't. Uh, some Someone is asked, uh, COVID pet heart failure, I see PEP or BiPAP, what is better? Uh, in my recommendation is that CPAP is better because CPAP, uh, it will improve the cardiac output uh, by changing the transmural pressure of the patient and it eventually reduce uh, both pre, it will reduce both preload and afterload. Um, that will help in uh, increase patient cardiac output and other thing is CPAP machine can help uh, help in uh, get rid of this uh, alveoli which has already uh, accumulated filled with the water. The question uh, about the FIO2 uh, bug in the like, uh, as uh, Chamar said that uh, we have only resmed uh, 100. If it is uh, 150 or 200, then only we can uh, measure the FIO2. Otherwise, uh, we can have a rough idea about oxygen. Uh, basically, we give about 15 liters of oxygen. And uh, I just according to the uh, I mean, according to the flow, only we can increase the FIO2, but only rough idea, but not the accurate idea. When you when you when you have a, a rest made 150 or 200, then yes, you can measure FIO2. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. Thank you very much. And next lecture will be done by Dr. Birbhuda Arachi. Excuse me, sir. One more question. Uh, what are the changes applying uh, HFNC when using for pediatric patients? Uh, what? That question, what are the words from What's that question? Uh, what are the changes that play high in the pediatric patient? Okay, in the pediatric patient, uh, uh, the only thing is that there are specific high flow nasal devices. You can't use adult one. And uh, other thing is uh, they are, you have to use the pediatric cannula, nasal, nasal cannula, cannula for that patient. And usually uh, we, you can go up to two liter, uh, liter per kg. That is a maximum level uh, you can, uh, that can you can use, and if that uh, you can start with uh, one liter uh, per minute per kg uh, the flow rate, and if the patient deteriorating, then you have to go to the maximum two liter per kg per minute. If patient is further deteriorating, then you have to uh, select intubation or do some something else. Uh, 
then that means that uh, high flow nice electricity will not going to work for that question anymore. Seems there are no questions. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Bhagindu Gunavardhana for his excellent presentation on behalf of the GMOA Coid Coordination Center and GMO Sri Knowledge Academy.